Good morning, good afternoon, and a warm welcome to everybody who has joined us today from all around the world. I'm Shruti Leka Rajay Lengo, UN representative of Women's Federation for World Peace International in Geneva, and I take honor in being the moderator for this session. That being said, on behalf of Universal Peace Federation, in cooperation with Women's Federation for World Peace International and Geneva Interfaith Intercultural Alliance, I welcome you all to the International Leadership Conference Session 5, the United Nations and the Korean Peninsula towards de-escalation and rapprochement between the two Koreas. Korea has been divided since the Second World War and remains without a formal peace agreement. Families have been separated for 70 years, left not knowing the conditions of loved ones. This unsolved tragedy, while very much an international affair of Korea's, needs the attention of the international community. The session aims to provide resources and good practices for de-escalation of tensions through disarmament and trust building strategies. Speakers will look at the destabilizing effect of nuclear issue and provide alternative tools for mediation and reconciliation. Finally, a proposal for a UN-sponsored peace development project at the border will provide a vision for stability on the peninsula and the whole region. Please note that Russian interpretation is available for participants who prefer watching the webinar in Russian. The question and answer sessions will follow after all the speakers make their speech. Please drop in your questions in the question and answers box on Zoom and not the chat box. Chat box will only be used for the purpose of sharing bios and other administrative instructions. So please use the question and answer sessions for the questions you wish to raise to the speakers. All that being said, allow me to welcome and introduce our first speaker of today's session, Ambassador Domingo. He is the Philippine ambassador to New Zealand and Island nations, a career diplomat with a broad multilateral political and consular experience. He has an extensive professional network among Philippines, Southeast Asian, United Nations, and other international officials. He is a broad graduate educator, education and professional training in international relations, law, and military affairs. Also, parallel career in academic and civic volunteerism. He has a particular professional interest in humanitarian and security affairs. His foreign postings included Philippine missions to the United Nations in New York, in Geneva, and the Philippine Embassy in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He has served Department of Foreign Affairs Assistant Secretary for UN and International Organizations and concurrently as the Secretary General for the National Council for UN Peace Operations. Ambassador Domingo, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, kia ora, magandang umaga po from Wellington, New Zealand. So I hope you're keeping warm. Maybe, is it summer in your part of the world? Because it's winter here. It was like we had some hail. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, Wellington is very much like uh, Geneva. And I had the great honor of working, of participating in ILC and being, I work very closely with the UPS, especially with, with Heiner and Caroline during my stint in, um, in Geneva from um, 20. Uh, from 2007 to 2013. And it's great to be with old friends. And while I was in Geneva, I was, uh, I was taking care of disarmament and um, humanitarian affairs. So um, while, you know, I'm still an active diplomat, so, you know, we are, um, we are not really allowed to speak on um, foreign policy issues unless we're so authorized. So uh, may I uh, flash, have the next slide flash, please? And yes, the disclaimer, the views expressed in this presentation are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Philippine government. Thank you. Okay, so with that out of the way, um, I thought though I could contribute to our discussions on the, um, the prospect uh, of uh, the peaceful reunification of the Koreas um, by uh, talking about the background on the issue of nuclear disarmament and how it plays out in the multilateral or United Nations system. So this is just a very basic um, primer. Um, and I'm sure our other speakers here can really um, provide more in-depth information. 
So this is just really an overview of what nuclear disarmament is all about. And again, this is one of the critical issues in the Korean Peninsula, um, nuclear weapons and the need for nuclear disarmament. Next slide, please. Okay, so we hear many terminologies, so let's, let's get things clear. So we talk about, and I try to put these in layman's terms. When we talk about nuclear disarmament, it's often confused with nonproliferation and arms control. So what's the difference between the three? Well, nuclear disarmament means eliminating nuclear weapons for everybody, including, of course, obviously, the uh, countries which do possess nuclear weapons. Now, nuclear nonproliferation means stopping other countries from having nuclear weapons, but then implicitly say, say well, those that have them, particularly the so-called um, N5, who we'll talk about just in a while, in a moment, um, are still allowed to have them then arms control is, refers to the limiting or reduction of nuclear weapons among the nuclear uh, weapons possessing countries. Now, um, there is a so-called N5 or countries which are quote unquote legally under international law allowed to possess nuclear weapons and they equate to the permanent five of the UN Security Council, UK, US, Russian Federation, People's Republic of China and the French Republic. Next please. Then we talk about other nuclear states whose possession, well, is not quite as strong as the N5 in terms of international law. Those are, there are countries who have declared and admitted they have nuclear weapons. Basically it's India, Pakistan, and North Korea. And there's a country which is believed to have nuclear weapons but was, does not officially admit it, that's Israel. Now, what is the term nuclear umbrella? It refers to those countries which do not themselves protect, uh, possess nuclear weapons of their own, but are quote unquote protected under the security framework of a nuclear weapons possessing country. Like uh, for example, um, United States, basically long story short, um, the member countries of um, its, its allied countries such as uh, other NATO countries such as Canada and so on are under the nuclear umbrella. Now, Australia also for, example, for that matter. Now, when we talk about weapons of mass destruction we talk about a broader family of, uh, as it says, weapons which cause massive destruction more than conventional weapons. And they're often all known by the acronym CBRN, chemical, biological, chemical, and, oops, sorry, I meant to say nuclear, CBRN. Uh, there's a typo there. Okay, and um, well, since we're talking about nuclear disarmament, the UN agency, which is in charge of um, things nuclear, is the IAEA, and I'm glad we have uh, Dr. Tarek here too, from, from the IEA, which is based in Vienna. Next, please. So um, what are the arguments for and against the possession of nuclear weapons? I mean, I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm just saying, well, how, how they justify. So why not? Obviously, well, if they were to be used, this would be, uh, assuring the destruction, mutually assured destruction among the countries which possess nuclear weapons. Once you start launch one, it's like they say about potato chips. When you eat one, you, you can't stop. So you've seen these various movies and um, TV programs uh, speculating on how a nuclear war would play out. You can't limit a nuclear. Once you start, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's very likely nuclear weapons possessing countries use them all or lose them. And that would be an untold humanitarian catastrophe. Also, well, they violate international humanitarian law. So, you know, IHL is about basically minimizing or eliminating the harms, gratuitous harms caused by the use of weapons, warfare, and they violate the four principles of IHL, humanity, distinction, proportionality, and necessity. Nuclear weapons perpetuate hegemony, I mean, meaning only a few countries dominate the rest of the world. Um, um, it perpetuates a disparity of net power among the haves and have nots of nuclear weapons. And it is expensive. I mean, these, it, it's not cheap. And, you know, you always have to wonder wouldn't mankind be better off if the budgets for nuclear weapons, well, weapons in general, could be placed to more productive humanitarian uh, use. Next slide, please. 
Okay. Well, of course, the pre, uh, sorry, uh, can we go to the previous slide? So actually, yeah, I mean, in the why not is actually more of a widespread um, sentiment and feeling among most of the world's countries and population. So I meant to say, well, what is the kind of justification of and coming from the nuclear possessing countries? Well, they bring, if you have them, they bring a certain prestige and power to those who possess weapons. So that's why there is a desire from countries to possess such weapons. Then the N5, you, well, we have them and you can't really make us give them up right now. <laughs> Then having them though, then there's an interesting argument. Having nuclear weapons has prevented an all out third world war after the second world war, because if you had the major, well, the superpowers go to war, like let's say in the cold war days between the US and the former USSR, once you start a direct conflict, it would rapidly escalate to nuclear and re resulting in mutually assured destruction. So there is that concept of deterrence, which if you possess that nuclear weapon, you are not going to think, you're going to think twice, thrice, four times before you attack that country. And this would be the rationale for other countries, uh, other than N5, to strive to push for obtaining nuclear weapons, because if you have them, you are much less likely to be attacked by a foreign power. But also on the scale of things, they are for the net effect much cheaper, relatively cheaper than conventional weapons, like aircraft carriers, tanks, and whatnot. Okay, next please. So how does the multilateral system or the UN system deal with nuclear weapons? Well, you know, the sole organ that is authorized the use of force and the principal security organ of the UN system is the Security Council. And it can issue sanctions and related to um, nuclear technology and whatnot, um, there have been sanctions issued against countries such as Iran and, and North Korea. But on the positive note, there are also resolutions issued by the Security Council to push for cooperation with respect to nuclear weapons, nuclear disarmament and so on. Um, in the General Assembly, you have the Committee on Disarmament which issues regulation, uh, resolutions but they are not, of course, as binding as resolutions of the Security Council. Then you have oh, a body which I spent a lot of my time in Geneva is the Conference on Disarmament, which is a body of, um, of many, but not all UN members. At last count, around 50. I, I've been away for some time, but around 50, maybe a little more. Um, it's the sole body that is authorized to draft treaties regarding disarmament and there are um, the following issues are among the issues which should be tackled but unfortunately because of the deadlock we're not really a we were not able really to proceed but anyway there would well in the past glory uh, the um the conference of disarmament has been able to hammer out um treaties such as the biological weapons convention for example but other other topics other issues would be fissile materials the raw material to create nuclear warheads and bombs nuclear disarmament, the prevention of arms race in outer space, and negative security assurances. What is an NSA? Basically the assurance that you know, a country won't nuke you, basically, long story short. Okay, next please. So what are the treaties and resolutions which are key? Um, well, there is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and um, that gave rise to the um, IAEA, and there are three pillars of the NPT treaty, nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, as well as the peaceful civilian uses of nuclear energy. And so there was a review conference every five years and I was able to participate in the, um, the 2010 when the, the, it was uh, held by the Philippines. Well, there is a CTBT, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which uh, seeks to, uh, again, pr prohibit testing of nuclear weapons, but that has yet to enter into force. Um, now the ICJ, another organ of the UN system, um, at least before the um, enactment of the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, it held that there was no jurisprudence outlawing nuclear weapons. Then there is a particular resolution of interest uh, from the Security Council of 1540, which basically uh, seeks to prevent and terrorists from 
access to weapons of mass destruction. Well, there are other WMD treaties, such as the Biological Weapons Convention and the Chemical Weapons Convention. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so there's also bilateral and country engagement, um, especially a lot between the US and Russia, former Soviet Union, which um, led to the um, other uh, agreements and frameworks, such as Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, um, the um, Intermediate uh, Nuclear Forces, okay, I'm sorry, I may get the acronyms all wrong, but um, the START, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty process. So anyway, there's engagement, bilateral engagement between US and Russia. There's various engagements and sanctions vis-a-vis -vis North Korea and Iran. Then back to the Conference on Disarmament. It, again, it was the sole treaty-making body and the, the, the issues of fissile materials, nuclear disarmament, PAROS and NSAs are on its agenda. Um, and the, there are nuclear weapons-free zones in various regions which um, pursue the independence and um, non-placement and hopefully non-use of nuclear weapons. And these include zones in Africa, the Antarctic, Central Asia, Latin America, Mongolia, and um, Southeast Asia. And of course, sorry, I left out the Pacific. Sorry, <laughs> okay. Um, all right, next slide, please. Okay, so a landmark development was the Treaty to Prohibit Nuclear Weapons, which was adopted on in 2017 and entered into force at January this year. So the, uh, the nuclear, ban treat, nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty uh, says no, basically, to the development, testing, production, acquisition, possessing, stockpiling, or the use of threatening to use nuclear weapons. There's the, it stipulates prohibition of deployment of nuclear weapons in national territory, and it calls for assistance to any state to prevent prohibited activities and assistance for environmental cleanup activities. Since yes, um, uh, stockpiling, developing, storing nuclear weapons does cause a lot of environmental damage. Next, please. So, well, how, how is it uh, implemented? Well, like many treaties, it follows the process of universalization, meaning getting as many countries to join up to it, and then advocacy to promote its, again, not just countries signing into it, but those who have signed on to it, um, actually carry out the activities you're supposed to do, and also engaging civil society. Um, now, there are also meetings of states' parties, which would be annually and review conference every X number of years to, to see how the uh, treaty is being uh, implemented and, and any need for amendments and so on. Then um, there's a very important aspect of implementing on the national level. So the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs has a implementation support unit to Master assist- Ingo, um, just a quick reminder that we have two minutes to wrap up. Uh, just oh, good, yeah. Um, almost done. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. Oh, no, 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 no. It's all right. Um, just two more slides. Okay. Next slide, please. All right. So now, well, what about countries that haven't signed up to it? Is it still something new? So obviously the nuke, the N5s and the other, you know, declared and, um, well, apparent nuclear weapons possessing states haven't signed up to it. So is it still useful? Yes, in the sense that it creates an international norm, it can increase pressure to eliminate nuclear weapons, divestment in industries and businesses which you know, produce nuclear weapons. And there was a precedent, there was a lot of international pressure, stigmatization of anti-personal landmines, very successful and somewhat successful, uh, cluster munitions and leading to treaties for both respective types of weapons. And then there is still an effect on usage on deployment because there would be a prohibition on the movement deployment of nuclear weapons in and through states parties to the test ban treaty. I mean, sorry, the nuclear weapons uh, treaty, uh, prohibition treaty. And therefore there would be effect of military operations. Um, now, just one thing is um, New Zealand has offered is really a fantastic country in really defying and being very bold in asserting an independent foreign policy. And they had actually moved their Western country, but very independent mind, they had moved out of the US nuclear umbrella. 
Um, so I'd like to say that New Zealand many times, is kind of like the Switzerland of the, of the Pacific. Okay, so that's it. Uh, next slide, please. Marami salamat po, thank you very much. If you want me to drop me a line, uh, there's my email, ambagaridomingo at gmail.com. So gamihi, maraming salamat po. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador Domingo, for all the deep inputs on the technical and global background on the use of non-proliferation and regulation of nuclear armament. It sure it, uh, has been a very good start for the discussion. Following Ambassador Domingo, I take much honor in welcoming and introducing Dr. Tariq Graf, who is, a, who is the former head of verification and security Pol uh, policy office, reporting to the director general at the IAEA in Vienna from 2002 to 2011. Dr. Rauf has been the alternate head of the IAEA non-proliferation treaty delegation 2002 to 2010. He has also worked as the IAEA liaison and point of contact Contact for the trilateral initiative, the plutonium management and disposition agreement, the fissile material control treaty, the Zango committee, the committee UNSCR 1540, and the UN counterterrorism implementation task force. He was responsible for the IAEA forum on experience of nuclear weapons free zones relevant for the Middle East. Um, he has been the official delegate at all NPT meetings from 1987 to 2019 as an official delegate, including an, a non-proliferation expert with Canada's NPT delegation, 1987-2000. I welcome Dr. Rauf. Dr. Rauf, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to first thank the Universal Peace Foundation and in particular, Dr. Hanshin and Dr. Atsuka for inviting me to join this distinguished panel to talk about uh, peaceful resolution on the Korean Peninsula. And I also would very much like to thank you, Ms. Lika, for being our moderator here today. So under the United Nations Charter in Chapter 7, Article 41, gives to the Security Council the authority to impose sanctions uh, as part of its mandate for maintaining and restoring international peace and order. And in that, the five uh, permanent members have taken on a special responsibility. I'm very glad that Ambassador Domingo referred to these five countries uh, that possess nuclear weapons as the N5 rather than the P5, the, because these five countries like to refer to themselves as the P5 uh, and conflate their possession of nuclear weapons with their status as permanent uh, members of the Security Council and there really is no connection between uh, the two. Uh, and also, if we look historically, the five permanent members of the Security Council have also been history's greatest proliferators of nuclear, chemical, biological weapons, and also spend the most on arms, uh, uh, as well as exports. So it's sort of quite ironic that these countries have a special uh, status in the Security Council for the maintenance of international peace and order. Having said that, the Security Council also has the authority to impose sanctions on countries for a variety of purposes, including non-proliferation. Since 1966, the Security Council has imposed sanctions 30 times, uh, including on the DPRK. And there also is a sanctions committee at the UN under Security Council Resolution 1718 of 2006, uh, looking at the implementation of sanctions uh, against the, the DPRK. So I would submit that there is not a single case of UN or any other sanctions that has successfully reversed or even arrested weapons of mass destruction proliferation related activities by target states. Such sanctions have failed in the cases of apartheid South Africa, India, Pakistan, Iraq, the DPRK, Iran, Libya, and Syria. In fact, the record shows that such, such sanctions not only failed to achieve stated ends, but in some cases even accelerated the development and deployment of types of weapons of mass destruction. The DPRK, in my view, is the poster child of such failed sanctions and policies. As someone reputedly once said, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And this is abundantly clear in terms of the way in which the DPRK nuclear file has been handled over the previous four decades. 
I have stood at the demilitarized zone that marks the border between South and North Korea at Panmunjom, entered the blue hut paint, uh, painted in UN blue, and crossed the painted red line on the floor, marking the border into North Korea, and the North Korean half of the hut, and then returned back to Seoul and here back to Vienna. The surreal experience there highlighted the failure for nearly seven decades to end the formal state of war on the Korean Peninsula and for separated Korean families and the nation to be reunited peacefully and to join the international community of nations as a single unified state. Something that was achieved in 1989 between the two halves of Germany, albeit the circumstances were quite different, including of course having enlightened leaderships at the time. So having worked on the nuclear files of the two states that shared the Korean Peninsula between them for more than a decade at the International Atomic Energy Agency, I can assert with some authority that despite the best efforts of the IAEA in its specific realm of competence, the concerned external powers and the Security Council cannot be credited with dealing with this matter intelligently with the complex situation that uh, uh, exists in the Korean Peninsula. In my view, the DPRK nuclear file possibly has been the most mismanaged file in the history of UN Security Council sanctions, with replete with failure after failure. The result being that for the first time, a state left the Non-Proliferation Treaty in uh, 2003, in this case, North Korea, and yet another country crossed the nuclear weapons threshold uh, in 2006, and again, this was North Korea. So it showed that the sanctions regime had failed. And actually, the international community is now worse off because North Korea has become a demonstrated possessor of uh, nuclear weapons. The post-Cold War practice of megaphone diplomacy hurling inane epithets such as axis of evil and shouting that country X should cease to do this or that, or that it is a rogue state, only reflects the bankruptcy of policy and arrogance of ignorance in my view. So the predictable consequences are before us. Regrettably, over the space of a decade from 2006 to 2017, six DPRK nuclear explosive tests, each more powerful than its predecessor, demonstrated that despite crippling sanctions, the DPRK has achieved greater progress in nuclear weapons and related ballistic missile delivery systems in a shorter period than in any other country that did not join the Non-Proliferation Treaty. In its wisdom or lack thereof since 2006, the Security Council has uh, adopted nine resolutions of sanctions on the DPRK, and I will not list them here given uh, our pressure of time. Sanctions regime against the DPRK is very broad. It covers everything from arms exports to exports of oil and gas, and also to purchases of uh, various goods uh, from the DPRK, including uh, uh, fish products. Uh, for example, the Security Council has authorized only supply of 500,000 barrels of oil per year and about uh, uh, 526,000 tons uh, of uh, oil and gas put together for a population of nearly 26 million people, which clearly would not be sufficient. So my point here is that generally speaking, UN sanctions end up targeting and harming ordinary citizens rather than the leaderships whose behavior change is expected as a result of pressure and sanctions imposed by the Security Council. And I already gave uh, some examples where such sanctions and pressure actually had counterproductive uh, results. So one should not regard my critical comments as condoning the DPRK's nuclear and missile activities or its political system of governance, or its practice of human rights, etc. And if by this time you might be realizing that my comments are not particularly charitable regarding the handling of the nuclear issue in the Korean Peninsula, then you wouldn't be wrong. Time does not permit to go into the details, and given the focus of this online conference on towards the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula, peace and security, let me offer some of the following views on the nuclear file in my remaining time. Renunciation of nuclear weapons ambitions, for example, by Argentina, Brazil, Republic of Korea, Sweden, Taiwan, China, and others, and the voluntary dismantling or surrendering of nuclear weapons by South Africa, 
and by Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine can offer useful insights into how to approach the matter of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. In this context, continuing with the refrain of complete, verifiable, irreversible dismantlement, or CVID, by the DPRK of its nuclear and missile programs is a bridge too far, an unrealistic goal absent broader political considerations of a formal end to the state of war, rescission of sanctions, and other developments conducive to a peaceful diplomatic resolution of unresolved issues and reunification of the divided peoples on the peninsula, among other developments. While I often do not have compelling reasons to quote US officials on nuclear matters, among the exceptions are, for example, President Barack Obama, who said, you can be completely right, and you still are going to have to engage with folks who disagree with you. If you think that the only way forward is to be as uncompromising as possible, you will feel good about yourself and you will enjoy a certain moral purity, but you are not going to get the results that you want. And this, in a sense, reflects uh, policy dealing with the DPRK. James Clapper, the former head of US uh, national intelligence, pragmatically observed in October 2016, and I quote him, I think the notion of getting the North Koreans to denuclearize is probably a lost cause. They are not going to do that. That is their ticket to survival. They are under siege and they are very paranoid. So the notion of giving up their nuclear capability, whatever it is, is a non-starter with them. The best we could probably hope for is some sort of a cap, but they are not going to do that just because we ask them. There's going to have to be some significant inducements. And lastly, in this context, I would like to quote former US Defense Secretary William Perry, who after leaving office is admirably devoting his efforts to reducing and eliminating uh, nuclear weapons, who aptly observed, and I'm consolidating his comments here, the DPRK nuclear crisis cannot be solved in isolation. Whether we like it or not, the DPRK will retain its nuclear weapons in the near term as a hedge to provide security. No degree of economic pressure or coercion, no economic reward, no military threats will persuade the DPRK leadership to surrender its nuclear program. Deal with the DPRK as it is, not as we would like it to be. Now, while during his term, President Trump was reviled and uh, ridiculed, uh, he did meet with the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un three times, and at the Hanoi summit meeting, the North Koreans reportedly offered to dismantle the Yongbyon nuclear site in exchange for the removal of all UN and US sanctions. Yongbyon contains roughly 80% of North Korea's nuclear weapon complex. Unfortunately, President Trump succumbed to pressure by his um, Foreign, uh, his Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Pompeo, and his National Security Advisor, and he turned down that offer. So in my view, an uh, unprecedented opportunity was missed. So let me conclude by proposing some elements of a possible DPRK, US, and regional compromise. And I'm not the only one who has proposed this. Other people have said this as well in different formats. So first, denuclearization is off the table as a starting point. Address the DPRK's security concerns and soften or remove sanctions regardless of one's views. For some specified period, the DPRK could retain a number of nuclear weapons for deterrence and cap its program with the moratorium on further nuclear and missile tests. The US could reaffirm its no attack assurance that was first given under President Bush uh, Jr. and also cease joint exercises with South Korea that practice decapitation and counter frost strikes against uh, North Korea. The International Atomic Energy Agency could start off by resuming monitoring of its civilian activities in North Korea, and nuclear weapon experts from China, Russia, and the United States could work with the North Koreans to consolidate their nuclear weapons and work towards their dismantlement under uh, international observation. So while these elements may not be an ideal solution, they will not please hardliners nor ideologues, nor do they address the broader political and human rights issues. But in my view, these elements could be the beginning of the fundamentals of a realistic and pragmatic policy dealing with the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and over the longer term, the normalization leading possibly to the reunification of the Korean nation when all Koreans can travel to Pektu Mountain and to Jeju Island. So with that, I will end my comments. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Rao, for bringing light into the current situation with strong references uh, to historical efforts and actions by global agents. This highlights the need for urgency for disarmament and non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Your proposals and strategic approach is more than just guidance to better action. Thank you so much. Now I'm very happy to lead the floor to Professor Dr. Angla Mickley. Dr. Angla Mickley is a university lecturer for conflict management, peace education, and ecology in the Department of Social Affairs at the Potsdam University of Applied Sciences. She also teaches conflict resolution, crisis prevention, and peace education at universities in Austria, Namibia, Georgia, Moldova, Armenia, and the Military Leadership Academy. She has also worked in Korea. A very, a very she is very interested in how people has, has, have resolved and resolved conflicts peacefully and by what means civil disobedience has succeeded. So therefore she designed an advanced training program called Conflict Management or Mediation and developed the first mediation training at schools in Germany. She developed and conducted peace projects for post Protestant and Catholic Northern Irish youth. Um, Welcome, Dr. Mickley, and please share your address for us. Thank you very much. Is, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. And um, of course, I'm very happy to perhaps contribute something to further movement in, in Korea. Um, yeah, I'm running there. There isn't so very much time. I, I'm trying to figure out which is the most important I should give you. And I think after we've heard these extremely interesting um, talks about the the frame, the political frame, the nuclear situation, the state um, pressure that is has been exerted towards and within Korea. I would like to concentrate on something very different on non state actors, which I always have been. I thought I was rather influential in, in Northern Ireland, not as a state actor, but in providing something that conflict resolution can, can do, and that is work without pressure, but still have an influence. Um, pressure has, by my uh, predecessor in speaking, has, has mentioned the, the effect pressure can have, the negative effect it can have. And we know it from an individual as well as from the Meso social, political, and the political sphere, pressure doesn't necessarily help change or movement or changing attitudes. So it's something that I'd rather not uh, use. I, the few times I tried it with my own three children, uh, it didn't work very well. And when I didn't have the chance to use pressure, um, I was quite happy to being able to use other means and. One of them is looking at an atmosphere, looking at a situation that is difficult, that is full of conflict. And I, you can see the world here behind me. Um, and I, I was trying to get Korea on um, to be visible. You can intervene into a conflict situation from very different angles. And the angle that I normally use. Um, one reason it is my um, preferred angle that is as a civilian, as civil society, and sometimes even um, not with a group, a mandate or anything official, but as an interested person who uh, would like to contribute something. And this is what I did in Korea um, exactly 21 years ago. And the request came from Korea itself to prepare, not like the Germans taking uh, no time or taking another wall, but preparing the very difficult task of reuniting the two Koreas. And I don't want to go into the training we did. I would like to say something about the, the, the general rules that help to initiate change and that help people initiate changes in their own behavior, in their attitudes, and in their addressing difficult situations. And we normally do this with trying to create an atmosphere of 
accepted failure, meaning we don't go into big official circles, but we work with officials in an unofficial atmosphere. We test certain behaviors, attitudes. People go through various ways of addressing a conflict, let's say, and they make mistakes. And the most important, I find, after learning different different methods of, of intervening, is to allow mistakes, to allow failure. I go in with a certain attitude, I go in with certain questions, and I notice the reaction I get is not what I intended. So I try something different. And to provide the space is the absolute opposite of pressure. You provide a space. We all know children need that, but we as adults need it as well. And politicians so much more because they are, they are normally in their uh, everyday activities, they are extremely under pressure. So to provide an extra space where, and I've worked with government in Namibia, I've worked with officials in, in Northern Ireland and in, in the Caucasus, and they were always very happy to have this space and not to be quoted with whatever not very effective um, intervention they tried. And this is a good atmosphere for learning. This is very nice and it helps develop new behavior, new attitudes for resolving conflict. The other effect it has in society as a whole is it provides a growing attitude for change. And we all know how difficult it is to change my own behavior, um, go on a diet, do things differently, address people in a different way. And to have this as an attitude that has been not trained, but practiced in a, in a secure environment is one path towards allowing it on the wider social sphere. So a society that has started to establish a routine of allowing failure, allowing learning, trying again, is a society that can go into a direction it formerly perhaps hasn't seen. In Germany, we've tried this when the wall came down. We've tried different things. We were successful in a few. We were not successful in quite a few more. Um, looking at what is the situation like 17 million East Germans suddenly didn't have their state context anymore. It simply vanished. This is not easy. It's like becoming a refugee without even leaving the house. Around you, everything changes. Um, and as my whole family, apart from my parents, is in the East, we had ample chance to discuss that. What is this like? What happens? What, what does it do to you? It takes the carpet from under your feet. Now in Korea, um, not that I know very much about Korea, I've, I've traveled there a bit and I've been with people and I trained a few journalists and um, politicians and people in NGOs in conflict resolution, in mediation. And the one thing that came back as, as um, response to what we we're doing was, it will be very difficult to allow attitudes that we are not used to. It will be difficult to have to be with North Koreans who've experienced a totally different state context, a totally different political context, and a very different context regarding who is who is running my life, who is dominating whatever I'm trying to do in this society. And when I look at the, I like to work with the triangle, um, you have an acute necessity to stop violence, to stop whatever is um, disturbing the peace, more or less. I think this has been covered by the, the, the talks we had previously. Then you have a second dimension, and that is the, the curative. What can you do to, to help, to heal, not just infrastructure, but also human beings? A lot of suffering has happened, a lot of 
people not being able to live the lives they wanted to live. So how can this be healed and directed towards a life that has been created in their own fantasy, not in somebody else's because it fits politically. And then the third is the preventive. How can the construction, the society structure, the way people vote, the way lower levels of society, the medium, the macro political level is being structured, how can this be changed towards allowing now from the southern Korean side, allowing a totally different system to be close to us, to become a partner at least, if not one immediately. And how can this be fed into the North Korean side? I imagine this frightfully difficult. And thinking about it in, in, in preparing for this, I was wondering how can you look at the possible situation and the state of mind of North Korean citizens with not even being able to meet them. So the only thing um, I suppose that you can actually do is work on the South Korean side. And as far as I know, <clears throat> it is not frightfully easy for North Koreans to integrate into South Korean society. There's a lot of difference, difficulty, being unused to all sorts of things that are, are done in a totally opposite way to uh, the way that it's being done in North Korea. And I would promote um, using trainings in the South in this one thing, working with difficulties, working with failure. And you probably know this from artists and in a circus <clears throat> when they're working high up in <clears throat> excuse me when they're working high up <clears throat> on the circus roof when they fall <clears throat> they immediately have to get up again and do it again and this is what we do in our mediation trainings i've done it with the <clears throat> military academies in, in germany and in namibia and in the caucasus and military is not, <clears throat> I'm sorry, military is not used to um, presenting their mistakes. But when you create a secure surrounding and a routine of, I can't do this, I fail, let me try again, I would like to try this or that or the other. When you create this safe space, they do and they love it. So I've seen NATO officers go through mediation training, look at <clears throat> how can I do this? Well, this doesn't really make sense. Why should this work? Well, try it anyhow. Oh, it does work. Very, very surprising. And the same has been done in, in Northern Ireland with people who were on a, on a violent path. And they tried <clears throat> to go into other forms of behavior that didn't really coincide with what their political and more violence oriented path was. <clears throat> I have a problem here. <clears throat> uh, Ms. Lika, how much time do I have? It's, um, we have one minute left, so. Ah, okay. um, please. <laughs> um, so, so I could just have a few last remarks. Um, do trainings, go into situations where people can practice and fail. Failure, I think, is the most important, really. Try new things and see how it works. And see in yourself how this routine of trying again, allowing the other side to connect and to say, no, this didn't really work for me. Try something different. And in this very creative space that you can create, for instance, with a common um, seminar with all sorts of people, with going on an outing and then being away from everything, looking at what difficulties do people see, are there similar or totally different attitudes and perspectives on the acute situation. Go into this with 
more space really than than you ever thought possible and create um, an atmosphere that can then develop attitudes and measures on a communal and state level that perhaps haven't been within the toolbox be uh, before you started. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McLee, for highlighting the social and personal impact of the situation in the peninsula. And thank you for highlighting that disarmament is not the end nor the beginning. Prevention, healing and reconciliation in all levels must be taken care of. Thank you so much. And now, as our final speaker, I'm very happy to introduce and welcome Mr. Heine Hanschen, who is the permanent representative of the Universal Peace Federation at the United Nations in Geneva and the director of Geneva Office for United Nations Relations. He is the coordinator of the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development in Europe and Middle East. He is a co-founder of Gen Geneva Interfaith and Intercultural Alliance that is a multi-stakeholder platform to prevent enmity through dialogue, um, mutual understanding and cooperation. Um, Mr. Hanshin studied Korean language, history and culture. During his stay in Korea from 1993 to 1995, he was part of the Swiss Korean Business Council when Switzerland was the fifth largest investor in Korea. Furthermore, he is the CEO of Swiss company dealing with geriatric healthcare. Um, Mr. Hanshin, please uh, deliver your address. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Excellencies and distinguished participants, good morning, or for those from New Zealand, good afternoon or good evening. <laughs> um, I'm very happy that I can uh, offer a few thoughts on behalf of the Universal Peace Federation. I have to say that uh, this, this panel has been so far very inspiring and very enlightening. Also, I have to say that uh, we have some partnership also in this uh, uh, organizing this panel, the Women's Federation for World Peace and also the Geneva Interfaith Intercultural Alliance. And uh, we're happy that uh, some of these things will uh, uh, also play in. And also in my presentation, the, um, sorry, that, that unfortunately that is a typo here. I sent a new presentation, but maybe it was confused with the old one. So that, that title is actually the United Nation and Korea towards the escalation and rapprochement on the Korean Peninsula. And uh, my uh, interest, my key interest for this topic was uh, the role that the UN could play as a broker for peaceful rapprochement and finally reunification uh, of the Korean Peninsula, uh, the UN, what could the UN do? So can I have next slide, please? Uh, so um, this a little bit uh, provocative, uh, are there chances for de-escalation on the Korean Peninsula? And when you see this picture, then you can clearly say, yes, there are chances. And uh, uh, also some of my co-panelists um, uh, mentioned this point that, uh, I mean, sometimes the unpredictable thing is happening and uh, we cannot, we can disagree with some of the administrations uh, here and there and also the, the whatever the governments in, in uh, key nations, but fundamentally what matters at the end is the, the results. And what is interesting is that there was a rapprochement uh, and in this uh, in these summits between USA and DPRK uh, against any expectations, because there was a time when the rhetoric between USA and the DPRK was the one of uh, confrontation, and then suddenly it turned into actually rapprochement and summits and meetings. And the first American president entered North Korea. This also has been quite historical. Now I just want to mention this because also I mentioned this, this one uh, uh, expression of uh, the chief negotiator in the uh, German, the team of the, the German unity, creating German unity, um, when he actually basically says in early 1989, nobody believed 
in uh, a German reunification to be as quickly as it really finally happened. And I, I, I think this is a point that we have to have an open mind and we have to uh, somehow make supportive efforts. And I think that's the reason why UPF and other uh, NGOs and partners are uh, investing into creating this, this uh, or letting the, the discussion uh, continue about a possible uh, reunification on the Korean Peninsula. Next slide, please. So what could be the role of the UN in, in this uh, uh, creating a peaceful reunification of, of the Koreas? Well, I see two big problems. The one is that, um, uh, first of all, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, <laughs> the, the UN has generally been focused, when you see this, these are beautiful uh, headquarters of the UN, they are focused mainly on uh, the Western Hemisphere. They are focused on uh, the Western world. They're focused on uh, the developed world. They're focused on uh, uh, basically one side of the world. But they're not so much focusing on actually Asia, even though we have regional offices in Thailand. But having uh, such uh, a focus like we see here, um, uh, that is in Asia, we can't say we have the same kind of thing. Then the second point, the second problem I see is that uh, the United Nations have, has been partisan in the Korean War. Uh, actually, the United Nations is seen by the DPRK rather as a hostile force and also as a, well, they were supporting South Korea and they were uh, like, like you said uh, uh, before, one of the speakers said the 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 DMZ, uh, the the uh, buildings are in blue in the, the on the on the UN side. So basically, it's the UN color. So that's for the DPRK. Even psychologically, still the opposition is the UN. Now, having said that, we know that the the, U, the DPRK joined the UN and. Um, uh, has been uh, since 1991 a member of the UN and they joined many, many organizations. But there were other organizations that the DPRK did not join and mainly the organizations, international organizations around financial institutions like the World Bank, like the International Monetary Fund, the Asian Development Bank. Also, the DPRK is not a member of the World Trade Organization and or the World Customs Organization, the ILO, that's all missing. And of course, uh, even though uh, the DPRK joined the IAEA, but it withdrew from it in 1994. So next slide, please. Um, as we see here, we have here a uh, member state, uh, 193, that the division of the different member states, we can say in the Western world, there are 52 nations. In Asia, there are 54. Now, how can you justify two headquarters or three headquarters, uh, New York, um, Vienna, Geneva, Vienna, and none of them really in Asia? So next slide, please. And this is becomes a little bit more extreme when we think about in terms of demographics. We have basically, can you uh, click one more time? I can't see everything. Is it? Oh, no, sorry. Go back. To, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we can see that in terms of demographics, we have two thirds of the, of the human population is in, um, in Asia and there is no real uh, UN office there. UN representation there comparable to, to uh, New York and, and uh, Geneva. So uh, next slide. Also in terms of trouble spots, we can say that there's a lot of trouble spots in the world that are located in Asia and particularly East Asia, Northeast Asia. Uh, one of the key trouble spots undoubtedly is the DMZ, the separation uh, between the two Koreas. The Korean Peninsula is clearly a trouble spot 
And from this perspective, I think if you imagine a shift in perspective, in, in uh, uh, focus towards the East Asia, that would be definitely also uh, a, a good thing. And then um, in terms of, uh, next slide please, in terms of the idea um, of a representation of uh, the, like some kind of a fifth headquarters of the UN on the Korean Peninsula, this I think has some justification. And uh, the idea came up the first time we had organized with UPF and partners a conference on disarmament in Geneva uh, in 2009. Can you put next slide, please? And yeah, here you see some of the uh, panelists and you can recognize some of the people. Also, this was a, a conference organized with, in partnership with the UNIDEA, the United Nations uh, Disarmament Research Institute, and also with the um, uh, support of two uh, governments, uh, the Philippines, as you see, and also the uh, Indonesia. And uh, also uh, the conference on disarmament was represented by Mr. Saeva that you can see also. So this was an idea, uh, this was a, a foundation where we basically launched for the first time this idea, why not to have a fifth UN headquarters in the DMZ? And this was launched by uh, the, the leader of a Korean NGO, uh, Dr. Chung Yun Park, whom you see also on the picture. Next slide, please. And out of this, uh, based on this foundation, came uh, a larger conference uh, in 2014, a two days conference where more elaboration was done regarding this suggestion of a fifth UN office in the DMZ, in the uh, demilitarized zone. And uh, we had the uh, um, the local, uh, the government of Gyeonggi province was co-sponsoring it and the, the, the uh, uh, governor was present and also Paju city mayor was present. And so we, we could see somehow that became, uh, became quite a, a substantial project and idea. And the Koreans were, became very excited about this idea. So next slide. <clears throat> Out of this, you see here like some kind of a UN peace complex uh, suggestion, which of course is a very uh, uh, interesting uh, project. Out of this uh, developed now a, a more concrete project that is currently, uh, of course, uh, proposed by civil society organizations like UPF, Women's Federation and, and others to, the, to use this really beautiful area of the DMC, of virtually untouched nature for, for 70 years untouched nature to create some kind of a UN peace complex that could be a common project for both sides where they could come together to meet and also uh, where they could uh, peacefully cooperate for something that could be a great attraction for the world. And the next slide, and this is my final slide, um, uh, we are going then this far as to imagine some kind of a UN city, like uh, similar like Kezong, the, 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 the uh, economical plan that was developed between the two Koreas. Now here we have maybe an idea of a, an international UN city that could be also not only for economical cooperation, but also for uh, all kinds of exchange and mutual cooperation, mutual benefit of both sides. This could be maybe a project that would be inspiring for both sides. So this is visionary. I agree. I'm sure you, you I, I don't want to make, a, it's not really realistic yet. It's in the project phase, but why not to start thinking in that way? And I thank you very much for your attention. So the slide is, the presentation is finished. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hanshin, um, for bringing the most needed pro uh, proposal of a new UN approach towards global affairs and um, um, the situation in Korea. And a UN city and a UN, um, and a UN campus in uh, Asia would be a great inspiration for global peace. Um, I once again thank all our speakers for the amazing knowledge, insights, and expertise they shared on the topic. It is now time to move into our Q&A session. 
So the first question I would like to direct to uh, Ambassador Domingo. So the question is from the audience. Hypothetically, uh, what could be improved among the disarmament related bodies to help reassure isolated na nations such as DPRK uh, into peace and security? Ambassador Domingo. Okay, uh, great question. And um, <clears throat> again, I can't speak for Philippine foreign policy, <laughs> but I could maybe share some of my more universal experiences. And um, I was um, heading the, um, the conference of the um, UN Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons back when I was in Geneva. And um, we were deadlocked with the issue of cluster munitions. Because on one hand, you have the Convention on, on, on Cluster Munitions, but the bigger possessors did not sign on to it. And then you have this other framework um, the, con uh, the convention and certain conventional weapons, which was on one hand looked upon as a possibility for getting the, the countries that didn't sign on to the CCW to have another, to have another attempt to at least have maybe a, some progress, but you know, sort of opinion was divided because the countries which signed on to these uh, cluster munitions treaty felt that would dilute. Anyway, long story short, you had polarity. Um, between two groups of countries. So sharing that, the challenge was, because you know, at the end of the day, you're dealing with people. And most of the time, most of my career, I had been working with the UN system. And coming here to New Zealand in a way was a very important break because you know, this is basically a bilateral post. However, I, uh, you get a, better appreciate, because normally when you deal with diplomacy, you come from a discipline of political science, of economics, of law. But, you know, the basis of political science, which is, you know, it's, you know, international relations is interdisciplinary, but political science is the leading um, discipline with due respect to those who are, <laughs> but the problem with that is the basis is states, nation states as if you know, they're all like one perfect automaton grouping, but you ultimately deal with people. So fast forward, okay, uh, my, okay, I can summarize my point. Ultimately, you're dealing with people. And though, and so, you know, ultimately, history is full of change. History repeats, there are cycles in history. They're always unexpected, I think one of the speakers referred to, oh, like, like Dr. Angela, nobody, I think you were talking about the unexpected breakthrough with the Berlin Wall and, and you know, the reunification of Germany. You never know when such opportunities may happen. So I guess making a long story short, it's important to always maximize your contact and engagement with individuals in the diplomatic arena. So, um, so I guess it's, it's good that, for, okay, so to summarize, one, Remember, diplomacy is a human activity. You have to set aside the states they may belong to. You ultimately deal with people. People have a course. I, well, you know, there are many differences, but there are some common commonalities. Number two, patience. And number three, there is always opportunities to network and work with me in, 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 you know, in Vienna, in, in Geneva. And hopefully, you know, I I'm, I'm, I'm hope that someday we could have a new um, center, uh, such as perhaps in Korea, for new. So it's, it's all about networking, making contacts. And ultimately, these are people. And you never know when they are, they are you know, the butterfly effect. They're in a position to have such profound um, um, influence. Okay, sorry, I'm babbling on. But I think my point is, ultimately, diplomacy is a human activity and engage with people and, and be patient. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ambassador Domingo. Um, yes, it is a domino effect, butterfly effect, and uh, we have to network for peace. Um, to Dr. Uh, Ralph, uh, there's a question from um, uh, Russia. Trying to see the disarmament situation from the DPRK point of view, 
Um, this country is pushed to abandon its nuclear weapons. At the same time, it is geographically situated between nuclear superpowers and uh, um, near NATO bases. Does anyone uh, expect DPRK to disarm when all the others are building up their nuclear arms? And how uh, do you think the situation uh, could prevail? Well, thank you for that question. It's, it's, it's a good question and a difficult one to answer. However, we have had previous episodes where uh, the father of the current leader of uh, North Korea agreed with the United States in 1994 on the agreed framework. They suspended their nuclear program in return for uh, economic assistance and the building of two nuclear power reactors. Uh, that agreement, unfortunately, uh, uh, fell by the wayside in 2002 under the, the Bush administration. And then the current leader as of North Korea, if we look at some of the statements at previous party congresses, he has reversed his father's priorities, which were to put the military first, and he has put social development and economic development above military development. And it was, as I mentioned, quite remarkable that he agreed to meet with President Trump and we still have one surviving benefit from that uh, engagement between the two presidents, and that is that North Korea still is maintaining a moratorium on conducting nuclear tests and a moratorium on conducting tests of long-range ballistic missiles. In March of this year, North Korea conducted the test of a short-range ballistic missile, but the media didn't report that this was in response to a short-range missile test by South Korea. So while North Korea is uh, surrounded by, uh, it has a border with one nuclear weapon state and it has two neighbors where, who have uh, defense arrangements with the United States underpinned with nuclear weapons. And the US had stationed nuclear weapons both in Japan and South Korea before, but then removed them uh, nearly 30 years ago. So I think there is potential for engagement if one needs to focus on these issues in a more balanced and fair manner. And as I mentioned, it's my final comment, megaphone diplomacy, insulting other countries, particularly when we want them to change their behavior is, is not the way to go. Thank you, Dr. Ralph. Indeed, um, it, we need to establish the balance and promote a more cooperative diplomacy than the blame game. And um, thank you so much for the response. Now the question is, uh, there's a question to Dr. Mitley. So this, is, this question is also from Russia. There were many South and North Korean students in Russia. There were also workers, artists, and other professionals living in Russia from both sides of the Korean Peninsula. After the sanctions which were imposed, all North Korean had to return home. What is the UN logic in preventing dialogue of North and South Koreans living outside Korea, and how does it impact on the whole de-escalation movement? Can I get the last sentence again? I didn't quite understand the question. The last so, sentence. Um, how, um, how does this, um, uh, how does this, uh, how, what is the UN logic in preventing dialogue between the North and South Koreans living outside Korea by imposing such sanctions, which basically uh, prevent them from interacting in uh, interacting or uh, in, in dialogues and de-escalating the situation. So they had the chance to interact uh, within Russia? Because yes, they but were because, working there. yes, but because of the sanctions, the North Koreans had yeah. to go back home and now the dialogue space is destroyed because of the sanctions. So how, what is the logic behind UN and how do you see this? Um, well, I'm, I'm not conducting UN affairs and um, my experience with sanctions, as far as I've seen from, from South Africa, um, is not very positive. Um, it, to, to create even more pressure uh, normally in an individual as well as in a group and even in a state uh, creates um, resistance. And the more pressure you put on, uh, very often the more resistance you get. Um, and it doesn't the space um, I've talked about space to to change. Um, you don't really give that space any chance when you um, when you prohibit 
interaction of people. We've seen, um, like I, I've worked with military in Namibia who were trained in the Soviet Union and they came with a certain state of mind that was, you know, um, well, inflicted upon them from, from um, Soviet times. And it was rather new for them to interact in a different way and to see their military tasks in a different way and to um, suddenly focus on something that they um, uh, urged me to, to uh, put into the curriculum as much more important and that is different cultures different cultures in this case in Namibia um, the cult you know, the way they talk to one another the way the various groups tribes interact in in the country so changes no not with sanctions it it simply doesn't work and it's normally it's the mass of the people who suffer it is not a government that suffers and i think this doesn't work with un principles true um uh, dr makley unfortunately the uh, goal of the sanctions are rippling negative negatively Thank you so much for the response. And um, now we have a question to Mr. Hanshin. Um, what are the chances of the two Korean governments actually agreeing to the idea of a UN city or a DNZ project as you proposed? How do you see the chances and how do you see the cooperative uh, situation for this uh, project? Well, it's a difficult, this is a very difficult issue, definitely. But I, I would say, I think the, 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 at, the, at this time, what we can do is uh, try to uh, emphasize and create incentives for, for both sides mm -hmm. that uh, this could be uh, uh, possible. It, it, can, it can work even with uh, maybe tourism, that there is a family, the desire on both Koreas to 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 uh, unite their families. There there have been efforts made already along this line. Um, it could be, of course, especially if it's like an, a project that could find investors from all over. Uh, it would make it more attractive. Uh, there have been studies made even about natural resources there for construction. That, that actually are there because of the, uh, especially in the area around uh, uh, Panmunjom, uh, there have been, uh, there's the Yellow River and there's these, uh, these uh, resources, uh, like for, even for, for concrete production, that would be uh, enormous amounts actually that could allow to make such a, a project. But of course there needs to be in investor state investor state actors and private so i think we can only try to emphasize this and uh, make it as attractive and incentive create incentives for both sides and uh, the rapprochement that is happening between the two uh, governments right now of north and south korea is well in its way but we need support like uh, if if a current u.s administration shows no interest in it this this would be devastating if, indeed yeah okay thank you uh thank you mr hanshin um and thank you so much once again to all our speakers for sharing your expertise for the amazing questions we had from our participants unfortunately due to time constraints we could not facilitate all the questions we received so that brings us to the end of our q a session and once again i thank all the speakers and all the participants for exchanging questions and answers now, please allow me to invite all our speakers once again to deliver their closing remarks for no more than two minutes each speaker. Um, Ambassador Domingo, please uh, give us your closing remarks. Uh, uh, Ambassador, you're oh, muted. Sorry. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, I guess my, um, my elevator pitch here is that remember diplomacy, <laughs> whatever issue is a human activity. And I think the most concrete thing we do, whatever, wh whether you are 
in the front line of you know, UN diplomacy, bilateral diplomacy, or civil society network. Diplomacy, you are the forward face. Be open, be engaging, set aside your prejudices, and always be this, um, this bridge. Think of yourselves as a bridge over troubled waters. And remember, it's a human activity. Network as much as you can. And remember, you ultimately, you will have a butterfly, a ripple effect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. That was an amazing uh, uh, statement for all the aspiring diplomats as well. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Rauf, uh, can we please hear your closing remarks? Thank you. So I was very glad that the three co-panelists all emphasized the human dimension and the people factor, and that is at the end what counts. Uh, the British Medical Association's journal, The Lancet, some years ago published an article that pointed out that as a result of UN sanctions on Iraq from 1991 to 2003, there were between 600,000 to 1 million excess deaths due to malnutrition, lack of medicine, and so on. Of course, the Iraqi government was also partly to blame. It also led to corruption. Uh, same thing with Iran these days. The Iranians are having difficulty getting uh, protection equipment and vaccines uh, for COVID. Uh, and they also, as a result of other sanctions, they have not been able to treat uh, nearly half a million cancer patients who need radiation treatment and other medicines because they are unable to import uh, these medicines. So if we look at North Korea, which is under even stricter sanctions, uh, it's not the leadership that is suffering as a result of these sanctions, it's the populace. And already they have warned about uh, the failure of the crops and famine coming. Uh, and I think it's, it's quite dehumanizing that the international community and the United Nations and its various organs are standing put and waiting for these people to, to starve or to suffer even more. So I would conclude by saying that to we in this international community, the NGO community and well-meaning people like the UPF, we need to talk to our governments to focus more on the well-being of the population of, the North, Korea, of North Korea, which hopefully in turn could lead to more change rather than squeezing North Korea even more, refusing to talk to them and pretending that doing this will make the problem go away. And as I pointed out, uh, nearly four decades of sanctions and pressure on North Korea has only resulted in North Korea becoming yet another country with nuclear weapons, having developed ballistic missiles, uh, and there has been no change. So this is a complete failure of policy. Uh, many millions uh, suffer needlessly uh, in North Korea. And the Russian question was very correct. When I was at CIPRI, we had a program to try to bring in four young North Korean diplomats to brief them on international uh, machinery, the one, the machinery that Ambassador Domingo um, described in his presentation. But because of UN sanctions, we were not uh, able to get these four young diplomats and expose them to diplomacy and other ways of doing business. So again, these sanctions are very counterproductive, and I'm very glad that UPF and all the distinguished panelists are working hard to focus on the well-being of people, and I think that should be our primary focus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rauf, and thank you for highlighting that um, the decisions of the international community not just influences the um, leadership, but beyond makes a greater impact for the um, humanity and for people who have no stake in um, the um, uh, issue uh, as much as the leaderships do. So thank you so much, Dr. Raf. And um, Dr. Mickley, please uh, give us your closing remarks. OK, thank you very much. Um, I can only subscribe to what the um, colleagues have, have said. Um, and I would like to give one more little input um, methods wise. And, and when you intervene in a country as an outsider, of course, there is no way to intervene um, as as a key decision making actor but when you have the chance to work with people in in a country that wants and needs change the the level to to address is normal
Um, unfortunately, I think we lost uh, Dr. Mickley. Uh, Dr. Mickley, um, you were you were frozen and uh, can you unmute yourself and please uh, repeat yes. the last sentence maybe yeah. for us? Yeah. Um, the best we can do in your own country and in other countries that we that we work in and that we are not even citizens of is to address the working level in let's say a government or in ngos or other official um, parts of the country you can much more easily work with the working level because they would have a bit more interest a bit more spice uh, space sorry a bit more time to address difficulties that they see and when i worked with paramilitaries in, in northern ireland we had three weeks on an island and they listened to each other and they listened to us and we tried various things and then they were able to use this in their own surroundings because we couldn't address and enter these surroundings i don't i'm not a paramilitary and i don't want to be um so this is very important to as as one of my predecessors said it's always people you work with so if you can get somebody from a working level in in an ngo in a government office get them because most people um including myself like to use the the tricks they've learned and new methods that you learned that have worked in a in a let's say a seminar surrounding um you want to do this again so it is a bit like yeast you need it and need it and then you sit it somewhere and it will grow and people do that i've seen so many people use the methods in a different way in different contexts see who you can get and work with those and they will do the next step without you much easier than than they've done it before so i can only encourage working on levels that you can address thank you Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mickley. Uh, thank you. Yes, indeed. Working in a collective uh, environment, collective work does bring change. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Mr. Hanshin, please uh, deliver your closing remarks. Yeah, I, I don't want to create another uh, half an hour uh, lecture. <laughs> <laughs> no, just a simple point, uh, creating incentives for both sides. And these incentives, like for instance, through a common project, we have to we have to see and study how we can, uh, like for instance, a project like I mentioned in my presentation at the end, uh, um, and uh, um, then the next point was mentioned by by all the speakers. But advocacy, 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 network, yeah. networking, networking. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Hanshin, for uh, giving a nice close point uh, on highlighting the importance of advocacy for everything. And that's what we're doing today as well. So thank you so much, Mr. Hanshin. And thank you one and all. Um, it was an honor sharing this platform with such brilliant, talented and inspiring, inspiring leaders on the occasion of the International Leadership Council. I would like to thank all the speakers for their great contribution today. I also thank the organizers and other technical assistants who made this look so smooth and easy for us. And beyond all, I thank the participants who joined us from all around the world and interacted with us with positive spirit and aspiration for change and peace. Now, please allow me to finish with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Let us be the change we wish to see in the world. Once again, we thank you all for being here and wishing you all a great day ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I like the UN city on the DMZ. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We maybe make a, a picture of all the uh, speakers and staff who yes. all the invisible but very important uh, contributors. Could you all maybe show your beautiful faces so that we can make a screenshot, Victor? <laughs> and Matteo, well, 
Yes. Are they coming on? Mr. Yurai Laida. No. Okay. So. Well, here we are. <laughs> and translators and our Russian friends, what is it? Come <laughs> on. <laughs> translators, hardworking people. Yeah. They are humble, too humble. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very okay, much. Goodbye. All good the best. Everyone. Bye. All the best. Bye bye.